Yesterday, as we all know, was Martin Luther King's birthday. There were a lot of television programs commemorating that. And coincidentally with that, you'll find in your handout materials two, uh, two sections that I would commend you to read at least before next week. The first is the letter to Martin Luther King from ministers in Birmingham. And the second is Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail. Uh, I will confess that I never read it in detail until I started preparing for this course. And in my humble opinion, it is absolutely written. And to think that it was not written on a pad, but it was written on scraps of paper that had to be smuggled out of the jail even adds more to the brilliance of someone who could compose that under such adverse conditions. There is so much that went on in this period that it would be impossible to cover anything like it in five weeks. And kind of like chopping cotton, I had to thin it out. So uh, what I had, what I'm going to go through, or what I consider to be high points. And as part of this, we're going to hear something, and I'm going to do something, frankly, I've never done. I'm almost 80 years old. I've never used the N-word. In this course, reading some quotes, I'm going to use it because it is the only way to accurately depict what people were saying in that day and time. This will be a first for me. The course will necessarily have many aspects that are subjective in nature, and I hope to deliver to you information that is as accurate as I feel it is, and in fact, it's coming from one who experienced many of the aspects or the subject matter that is uh, the subject of what we're going to review. With all that being said, it's important to, for you to know exactly where did I come from. Prior to going to college, my formative years were spent in Chattanooga, a city of about 125,000, situated in southeastern Tennessee, with the city limits to the south being the Georgia state line and Alabama being 30 miles to the southwest. North Carolina was less than 100 miles to the east. It was the home of Rock City and Top Lookout Mountain. And those of you who may, who may have traveled in the eastern and southeastern part of our country saw many Sea Rock City signs painted on barns throughout that part of the country. It was also advertised that one could, on a clear day, see seven states from Rock City, which was a top lookout mountain. That was, and it's hard for me to believe, but with certainty, one could see Tennessee, North Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina. Once one has this geographical setting in mind, it is most apparent that I grew up in an area of the South that was truly segregated. This applied to schools, buses, water fountains, restrooms, restaurants, hotels, physician offices, that is, to the physicians that would treat both black and white patients. And when in the 40s and 50s, these were few and far between. And in Chattanooga, I don't remember there being any black physicians or dentists. But those that the white doctors that, and dentists that did treat black people had two waiting rooms. That was just the way it was. Now, interestingly, housing segregation applied to Negroes and Jews as well in Chattanooga. Uh, I am Jewish, and in Chattanooga in the 40s and 50s, there were restricted neighborhoods that barred both. And if one was Jewish, you could not work for a homeowned life insurance company. There were three of them there. Or a bank, or the major two department stores. That was the way it was. And I'm going to use this term often, because that's just the way it was. And I knew no different. Housings for blacks in Chattanooga in those days can only be described as pitiful. If there was black ownership, I was totally unaware of. I did know of white-owned black rental properties 
and it was a really, really big deal when the city mandated the abolition of outhouses in favor of indoor commodes. Hard for this audience to believe it's the way it was. My mother had been born in Chattanooga several years after her parents and two of her siblings had immigrated from Russia. They said Russia. In fact, it was from some still just outside of Kiev, right out of Fiddler on the Roof. And I never knew my maternal grandfather, who died long before I was born, but I was very close to my maternal grandmother. My father had been raised in New Jersey, and both of his parents were immigrants. His father from England and his mother from Galicia, an area of Poland long before having been annexed by Austria. In retrospect, both of my parents were segregationists. My mother, more so than my father. And why? I don't know. I didn't know then. I don't know today. My mother grew up in a black neighborhood. Her parents had a small grocery store on the first floor of a two-story building. They lived on the second floor. If my mother had any playmates, they had to be black because there were no other whites in the neighborhood. But she was an ardent segregationist. When we had domestic help, they had to use the commode in the basement. They had to have lunch sitting on a stool beside the kitchen counter. And they had their own set of utensils and a glass. My mother always said they liked it better that way. <laughs> they rode the bus, and pay was either $3 or $3.50 a day plus car fare. Rosalie, who came one time per week, the Heron Shirts lived in a rental owned by my grandmother, and I remember that her rent was less than $5 a week, so one can imagine the type of condition of the housing that was available to her. I attended public schools through the seventh grade and then went to Macaulay, a private high school that was semi-military. <clears throat> there was no marching between classes, but we did wear uniforms and had daily drills. Macaulay was founded by and run by headmasters loosely affiliated with the Southern Presbyterian Church, and they made it very clear the Southern Presbyterian, not Cumberland Presbyterian, not Presbyterian USA, but Southern Presbyterian. Very, very conservative to say the least. Uh, chapel was a daily ritual before classes began, and we had at least two revivals per year plus Bible was a compulsory course. Needless to say, my exposure to Christianity was more than casual, and it has proven to be a real asset through the course of my life. Other than our household help, I had virtually no exposure to Negroes, as they were referred to in those days. Within a week after graduating high school, and a month before my 18th birthday, I found myself in basic training in Fort Jackson, South Carolina. My father and my closest friend's father had enlisted us in the Army <laughs> and signed us up for a program that allowed one to be on active duty for six months and then be in the reserves for seven and a half years. This began my first real exposure to people who were black. There were no African American recruits in my basic training company. But many of our sergeants were black and veterans of the Korean conflict. Then, too, at Fort Jackson, there was an area referred to as Knucklehead Colony, composed of about 10,000 men, the vast majority of whom could not read and write and had less than fourth grade education. They were black, and most of them had high school diplomas from schools in either Washington or Baltimore. Some of these soldiers were integrated in barracks where I was housed after basic training, and it was not unusual for them to ask me to read letters they received from home. Most often, these letters were written phonetically, and if you've ever tried to read phonetics, it is not easy. I am sure the people I attempted to help felt that my literacy level was not too much better than theirs. <laughs> In January of 1957, I started my undergraduate work at Vanderbilt in Nashville, and there began for the first time to have interaction with blacks. Not at Vanderbilt, but at what was then Tennessee A&I, 
a black school that featured run and gun basketball. Uh, two of the more notable players who went on to NBA fame, I remember, were John Barnhill and Skull Barnett. The SEC teams, Vanderbilt being one of them, were not nearly as exciting, so many of my friends and I went to Kingsville Guard to watch A&I. We were welcomed. I don't know that they would have been welcomed at Vanderbilt. And in somewhat limited contact, I soon learned that they, which is the code word for blacks even to this day in the South, were no different than me. We all wanted an education and the life we could develop provided we had this education. It was a couple of years later that the lunch counter sit-in started in Nashville, and we'll cover that later in the course. Following undergraduate school and law school, plus two years working for the Treasury Department, I ended up in Memphis, Tennessee, working for a small firm. There were few black lawyers practicing in Memphis at that time, probably about eight, which is not many. As a baby lawyer, I was at the courthouse almost daily and was able to observe that the black lawyers commanded minimal respect from too many judges. That one of these lawyers in particular, named A. A. Lagging, was and is, in my opinion, as fine a lawyer as practiced in Memphis. I didn't understand why they were restricted from being members of the Memphis Bar Association. And Tennessee did not have an integrated bar. I think California. California does. Once you pass the bar exam in California, you're automatically a member of the bar. In Tennessee, you had to join either the state bar association or the local bar association. They were separate entities. And the Memphis Bar Association prohibited blacks from being members. Now, the Memphis Bar Association had this huge law library that was in the courthouse, public building, and that's where so many of us who couldn't afford our own law but library got our information. But if you were black, you can't use it. That's the way it was. Whatever reason I decided to speak out about this, and this certainly did not endear me to my employers, who subsequently for this and other reasons fired me. So, I was out on my own in a strange city and was fortunate enough to secure a space in the office of a lawyer that had substance abuse issues. And the deal was he would let me have space for free as long as I would cover for him, and that I happily did. I felt that an avenue to overcome this was to expose blacks and whites to each other on neutral turf, and what could be better than in civic organizations that were in those days quite prevalent, as well as churches. Now, I was under the assumption there was one God for both blacks and whites. But when several very well-dressed blacks attempted to go to the Second Presbyterian Church, they were promptly arrested and physically hauled off to jail under one charge or another. The theory of equality in churches thus went down the drain. At that time, I was a member of the Memphis JCs, a young men's organization with over 700 members. And that was a feeding ground for future politicians. Uh, we took the unheard of step in admitting black members, and this provoked reactionary response, to say the least, especially among other civic organizations. Our president at that time was a fellow and a good friend of mine by the name of Dan Wilkinson, who was a grad from Boston, graduate of Dartmouth, and uh, he and I and a few others decided that we needed to integrate, and this was in 1967. For some reason, I became the one to sponsor a black member, and as a result, suffered financially and professionally. I lost a lot of the very little business that I had. Now, over the years, this reversed itself, but in those days, my economic circumstances or to say the least, extremely modest. In fact, I think as a result of that was why I was able to prevail in several elections or not have opposition. And there's, there's two ways to run for public office. 
One is scared, the other is unopposed. <laughs> so, here we are today, beginning a course that take us, takes us back to an era where the speaker, me, being a product of a segregationist society, to one who early on became a social liberal. Where to begin? This took me a long time. After proposing the course, one of my greatest challenges was, where do I begin? Do I go back to 1619 when slaves were first brought to this country? Do I go back to the triangle of slave trade? Do I go back to Eli Whitney, the cotton gin, the vast expansion of the cotton trade and the necessity for labor? Obviously, way, way, way too much. So I look to two major events. One that we will talk about at length today is Emmett Till that occurred in 1955, and the other is Rosa Parks uh, and, the Birmingham, and the Montgomery boy, bus boycott that also occurred in 1955. Let's get to the specifics and the results. In order to get to 1955, we really need to go back to 1896, where a lawsuit emanated from Louisiana to the United States Supreme Court. Basically, the facts were <coughs> and are that an individual who the proof shows without contradiction was seven-eighths Caucasian and one-eighth African-American boarded a train traveling from two points within the state of Louisiana. This was a setup to test the Louisiana statute. This individual took a seat in a car designated for what was then referred to as the white race and was told by the conductor to remove himself to a car reserved for the colored race. He refused, was forcibly ejected by the police. I guess it was an early version of United Airlines. <laughs> for having violated the Louisiana statute. And the statute reads, and this is in the handout materials, that all railway companies carrying passengers and their coaches in this state shall provide equal but separate accommodations for the white and color races, providing by providing two or more passenger coaches for each passenger train or by dividing the passenger coaches by a partition so as to secure separate accommodations. Provided no person or persons shall be admitted to occupy seats in the coaches other than the ones assigned to them on account of the race they belong to. This case, Plessy versus Ferguson, stands for what we now call, quote, separate but equal, end quote. And what was separate but equal? On the left, we have the example of a white school, grammar school, probably in the 60s, because I don't remember best that nice crowd at the grammar school. On the right, you've got a rural black school. And these were prevalent throughout the South. Moving on, and we'll talk about Little Rock Central more next week, but on the left, you have a picture of Little Rock Central. On the right, this is the black high school that was set up in Little Rock in 1956, the year before the events that, again, we'll talk about next week. So this is what separate but equal looks like. It was very, very interesting in the Plessy case, there was something called dictum. Dictum is language that has absolutely nothing to do with the issue before the court, but lets you look into the mind of whoever wrote the opinion. And then in the dictum in the Plessy case states, and I'll quote again, the most common instance of this is connected with the establishment of separate schools for white and colored children which has been held to be a valid exercise of the legislative power. Separate but equal was prevalent in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Chattanooga, we have one white high school for Chattanooga City. 
one black high school, Chattanooga Howard. And when new textbooks were issued, they went to Chattanooga City. And after they were worn out two or three years, they then went to Chattanooga Howard. That was separate but equal. Same thing for all athletic goods. Separate but equal stood the test of time from 1896 until 1954. The landmark decision in Brown versus Board of Education was, in my opinion, the decision that gives rise to the civil liberties cases and causes and the reaction particularly in the South. The succinct statement of the facts is in the opinion itself, and I quote from Chief Justice Warren. In each of these cases, minors of the Negro race through their legal representatives seek the aid of the courts in obtaining admission to the public schools of their community on a non-segregated basis. On each instance, in each instance, they have been denied admission to schools attended by white children under laws requiring or permitting segregation according to race. This segregation was alleged to deprive the plaintiffs of the equal protection laws under the 14th Amendment. In each of the cases, a three-judge federal district court denied to the plaintiffs on the so-called separate but equal doctrine announced by this court in Plessy v. Ferguson. Under that doctrine, equality of treatment is accorded when the races are provided substantially equal facilities, even though these facilities be separate. The plaintiffs contend that segregated public schools are not equal and cannot be made equal, and that hence they are deprived of the equal protection of the laws. Because of the obvious importance of the question presented, the court took jurisdiction. The argument was heard in the 1952 term, and re-argument was heard this term on certain questions propounded by the court. The court then concluded that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Therefore, we hold that the plaintiffs and others similarly situated for whom the actions have been brought are, by reason of the segregation complained of, deprived of the equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. This disposition makes unnecessary any discussion whether such segregation also violates the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Again, this was argued by Thurgood Marshall, who we see here with his coterie of co-counsel entering the Supreme Court. And the operative language is just this one sentence. We conclude that the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Now, this opinion set off a furor, particularly in the South, where organizations known as white citizens' councils were hastily formed, and churches set up a set of private schools that exist until this day. In fact, in Memphis, where I spent my adult life, the racial balance in the city public schools is about 90% black and 10% white, while the racial population is 60% black and 40% white. And this disregards white flight to incorporated municipalities outside the city whose growth was accelerated by school segregation schools. In Mississippi, May 17, 1954, was dubbed Black Monday. Black Monday was the subject of a speech by, and later a pamphlet published by one Thomas Pickens Brady. Brady went north to Lawrenceville Prep in New Jersey, school of summer now, then to Yale, where he graduated in 1927, and the University of Memphis Law School, from which he graduated in 1930. Now, back then, there was only one law school in the state of Mississippi. 
which was <coughs> Old Miss or University of Mississippi. And once you graduated from Old Miss, you were automatically admitted to practice in the courts of Mississippi. You didn't have to take the bar. If you went to Harvard or Yale or Michigan, you had to take the bar. Which <laughs> did limit some things. Uh, Brady practiced law in Brookhaven, Mississippi, became a circuit court judge there, and was the intellectual godfather of the White Citizens Council in Mississippi before being elevated to the Mississippi Supreme Court. Brady delivered his initial scathing speech at a meeting of the Sons of the American Revolution in Greenwood, Mississippi. Among other things, this veterans will view the following both formally and later from his book, and this is the best picture I could get of him. Uh, like the only one I could find. And this is what he says. Members of the nation's highest tribunal may be learned in the law, but they were utterly lacking in common sense when they rendered Monday's decision. Common sense of the can kind that should have told them about the tragedy that will inevitably follow. Human blood may stain southern soil in many places because of this decision, but the dark red stains of that blood will be on the marble steps of the United States Supreme Court building. The day that the Dutch ship landed on the sandy beach of Jamestown was the greatest day in the history of the American Negro. This resulted in the now slaves to lay aside cannibalism. Another <laughs> voluntary custom. Straight to speak. You can dress a chimpanzee, housebreak it, and teach him to use a knife and fork. But it will take countless generations of evolutionary development, if ever, before you can convince him that a caterpillar or a cockroach is not a delicacy. Likewise, the social, political, economic, and religious preferences of the Negro remain close to the caterpillar and cockroach. This, in essence, reflects the mantra of the Citizens' Councils that spread throughout Mississippi and the segregated South. It was this atmosphere that brings us to the story of Emmett Till, but I think this is a good time to answer any questions you might have and take a break. No questions? I have a question. In what way was your family affected by the segregation at that time? No, my parents practiced it. Was there a Jewish community of which they were a part? Yeah, most of the Jewish community practiced it. I don't know why, it made no sense. Because they were virtually all, or the Orthodox where I grew up, they were all first generation. I mean, they came from absolutely nowhere. I mean, they came to this country with children and clothes on their back. In the case of my grandfather, he came without his family to make enough money to send back for his family. And why they were segregationists, I don't know. You know, my brother and I have discussed it over and over. We've never come to a logical conclusion. Well, what I meant is in what way was your family excluded from white society? Well, you know, my father owned a liquor store, so he couldn't be a member of the Kiwanis Club. Mm -hmm. There were places we couldn't live. And that's just the way it was in Chattanooga. Diane was from, from Memphis, and Memphis was much more liberal, so maybe she can, she can help me. Well, as a kid growing up, we had um, a black maid in the house. My aunt had two black maids in her kitchen. She they were had, prosperous. Yeah, <laughs> she had a black gardener. Uh, and as a kid growing up, I never thought too much about it, even though I remember going to the movies and seeing black water fountains and black, you know, doors for admission for blacks. Sue had a day for blacks. Fairgrounds had a day for blacks. It wasn't until I was a teenager and I took a trip with a Jewish group that I realized what was going on, sort of, you know, at a 13-year-old level. And Memphis was much more progressive 
than Chad Huggles, who they had a separate entrance in theaters for blacks and whites. In Chad and Huggles, we had separate theaters. Yes. Maybe a bit of a personal question, but did it cause a rift between you and your parents when your stance? The question you? was, did it cause a rift? It, it caused a real rift. And uh, well, it depends on. on Sometimes you've got to know when to hold them, and sometimes you've got to know when to fold them. And since they were paying the bills, I had to keep my mouth shut. I'll never forget when my brother told my father that he had voted for Hubert Humphrey. My father just was apoplectic. They didn't speak for quite a while. So, yeah, you know. Any other questions? Let's take a break. I picked up an issue of The Economist dated December 23rd, 2017, and I just want to read one paragraph of that. It really struck me as we get into Emmett Till. As a child prodigy and pioneering sportsman, Mr. Abdul Jabbar witnessed many cycles of racial progress and setback. Growing up in multicolored Harlem as Louis Alcindor, the son of a police officer and seamstress, he says he did not realize he was black until the third grade. Yet he cites the murder of Emmett Till, a 14-year-old African-American lynched in Mississippi that same year, 1955, as having a profound influence on him. I couldn't understand it, and my parents didn't have the words to explain, he says. Okay, it was this atmosphere that brings us into Emmett Till, and just who was Emmett Till? Where did he come from, and what transpired? Emmett Till was born July 25, 1941, in Chicago, Illinois. His mother, Mamie Catherine, later Till, later Bradley, was born in Webb, Mississippi, and that comes into play later on. And as a two-year-old, she was moved to Harbor, Illinois, which was about 12 miles from Chicago. In October of 1940, she married Lewis Till, and then was born nine months later. The relationship between Emma's parents was tumultuous, to say the least, and they separated in 1942. Lewis joined the Army, was court-martialed for having been convicted of raping two women killing a third while stationed in Italy. He was executed by the Army for willful misconduct. His few belongings were shipped to Mamie, and they included a silver ring engraved with the initials LT, which plays a major role in this saga, as does Mamie. And here we have a picture of Emmett when he was 14 years old, probably taken the December before his murder, a picture of his mother, and the two of them together. A Reverend Moses Wright and uncle of Mamie went to Chicago in August of 1955 to officiate at a funeral. And after telling many stories about country life in Mississippi, brought back with him his two grandsons, Curtis Jones and Wheeler Parker, Jr., and his nephew, Emmett. Before leaving Chicago for Argo, or Argo for the trip to Wright's home in Money, Mississippi, Mamie warned Emmett to avoid conversations with white people, speak only when spoken to, always say yes sir and yes ma'am, and if a white woman walks toward you, you take to the street and lower your eyes. Before leaving, Mamie gave Emmett the silver ring with the engraved initials LT on it. And Emmett and his great uncle arrived in Mississippi on August 21, 1955. And we're going to see a lot happen over the next month. On August 24th, Wright's three sons, his two grandsons, and Emmett picked cotton all morning. And as a reward, did not attend Wright's Wednesday night prayer meeting. They got the loan of Wright's 1941 Ford, and despite Wright's admonition to drive only a short distance from home, they drove some three miles to Bryant's Grocery. This is Mississippi, as we see 
a little geography, certainly the South. Memphis is here, Tennessee, Alabama, Florida, Louisiana, Arkansas. And this is Bryant's Grocery in Money, Mississippi. There are conflicting stories about what happened in the store, but it's uncontroversial controverted that Carolyn Bryant was alone manning the store and that when Emmett was in the store they were alone for no more than one minute. And this is Carolyn Bryant. And who was she? Carolyn Holloway Bryant was born June 23, 1934 in Kruger, Mississippi, which is a plantation town. Her father was a plantation manager, suffered a series of strokes, and died when she was 15. She and her mother moved to Indianola, which incidentally is a city where the Citizens Council was later founded, and also the home to B.B. King, the famed musician. Carolyn won several beauty contests and met Roy Bryant at a party. Roy joined the Army, saved his money, and he and Carolyn eloped and married when she was 16 and before she even finished high school. Roy Bryant was the son of Eula Lee. Morgan Myla Bryant. Eula Lee had eight sons and three daughters by two different men, was a tough matriarch who drank whiskey for breakfast and carried a pistol in her purse. This was a true gracious family. Roy and his half-brother J.W. Milam were close. The Milam clan were what is known as Peckerwoods by their brothers. Okay, this pyramid represents the social structure in the Mississippi Delta and throughout part of the South. Now, the Pecker Woods were people who drove around in pickup trucks with whoop antennas, they say, and a gun rack in the back. They also did a lot of hauling. Uh, they picked up, they had some small <coughs> stores in the country like the one we just showed you. And above them were the small farmers, that is, people that farmed less than a thousand acres. Then you had the merchants, professionals, and bankers, plantation owners, and if you saw the movie, The Long Hot Summer, you could think you had somebody who had the plantation, the cotton gin, the store, what they call it, furnish, it kept people in slavery, and we don't have time to get into that, uh, with the time that's allotted to us, but they were, that was strictly the upper crust. Now, with this cast in mind, let's return to August 24th of 55. Carol and Brian had two versions of what transpired that day. The first that she told was, as we're now quoting, was I waited on him, and when I went to take his money, he grabbed my hand and said, how about a date? And I walked away from him. And he said, what's the matter, baby? Can't you take it? He went out the door and said goodbye, and I went to the car and got a pistol. When I came back, he whistled at me, this while going after the pistol, and he didn't do anything further after seeing the pistol. <coughs> at the trial, she testified differently, and we'll get to that when we get to the trial. Years later, in an interview, one Ruthie Mae Crawford told a documentarian that she watched him through the plate glass window the entire time, and that the only mistake he made was placing his candy money directly in Carolyn's hand rather than place it on the counter. This was the practice between blacks and whites. And the following Sunday, on August 28th at about 2 in the morning, Moses Wright was awakened by two white men, J.W. Mile and Roy Bryant, who called out, We want to talk to you about that boy from Chicago who done that talking up at money. Both were carrying Army 45 automatics, marched through the house, accosted Emmett, and asked whether, quote, he did the talking, end quote. Emmett said, yeah, and they took him away. Elizabeth Wright, Moses' wife, was alarmed, ran to the home of white neighbors for help. The wife wanted to be of assistance, but her husband would not agree, didn't want to get involved. She was extremely distraught, returned home, packed a suitcase, got Moses to drive her to his, her brother's house in summer, told him, that is, the brother goodbye, 
And then Moses took her to the train station in Clarksdale, where she boarded the train bound for Chicago and never returned to Mississippi. On Wednesday, August 31, Robert Hodges, a 17-year-old, was running his trot lines in the Tallahatchie River. And that is a method of fishing for catfish. Um, anybody wants to know what it is, and we have time, I can explain it. Mm -hmm. I sold a lot of trot lines. While doing this, he saw toads protruding from the water. Hodges then called his father, who was a sharecropper. The father called his landlord, who then called the landlord's brother, who was the deputy, who then called Sheriff H.C. Strider. The sheriff obtained a boat, and with some difficulty, they pulled the body anchor by an iron fan from the Tallahatchie River. The fan had been lashed to the body of the corpse with barbed wire that had become loose, and for that reason, and that reason only, the body could still be at the bottom of the river. Soon after the body was pulled from the river, Deputy Sheriff John Ed Cochran from Lafleur County, which was adjacent to Tallahatchie County, arrived. Sheriff Strider was there, and there was always discussion as to which county had jurisdiction over the apparent murder since the body, and since the body was found on the Tallahatchie County side of the river, all future proceedings were held in Tallahatchie County. Let's back up a little bit. And looking here, you see Tallahatchie County is a square, but this squib, that's the river. That's the river. And to the south is Greenwood and Florida County. To the north is Sumner, Charleston, and Tallahatchie County. But the body was found on the Tallahatchie County side of the river, and so all proceeded. Strider noticed that what looked like a bullet wound was above the right ear and the left side of the face of the body that was, quote, beat up. Reverend Wright was called and identified the body, and a silver ring was removed from the finger. It was engraved with the initials LT. Now, through all the research I've done, I have no idea why they called Reverend Wright. None of the people who have written about this talk about it, uh, but it's quite a coincidence. Pictures of the body were taken by the Greenwood Police Department, and a black undertaker was called to take the body away. <clears throat> Through a long set of circumstances, no funeral was held in Mississippi, and the body was sent to Chicago. And there, Mamie, now Bradley, not to be deterred, amounted an amazing publicity campaign which resulted in Chicago's newspapers, radio, and television mediums concentrating on the story and thus spreading across the country. The heading on chapter 8 of the Tyson book, which I cite in your bibliography, sums it up. Mama made the earth tremble. The body was returned to Chicago on September 2nd, and on September 3rd, over 40,000 people viewed the body. The funeral was held on the 6th, and by that time, there were, according to the Chicago Tribune, over 100,000 people to view the body. And this is what they saw in the coffin. This is a close-up. Not a very pretty sight. Now, at this point, Let's return to Mississippi where things, <clears throat> in my southern dialect, got, as I say, curiouser and curiouser. <laughs> While much has been written about the trial of Mal and Bryant, just how did the matter get to trial? Much, much by happenstance and luck. I just happened to call my friend Renee Turner Roth last year on her birthday, which was April 26th. In the course of our conversation, she told me about a blog forwarded to her by her sister the prior year and sent me a copy. That's all she told me. Now let me digress just a bit. 
to, to put the killing of a black person in Mississippi in perspective in 1955. Only a few weeks prior to the Till kidnapping and murder, Reverend George Lee and McComb and Lamar Smith in Cleveland had been killed because they attempted to register black voters. On August 12, 1955, <coughs> Lamar Smith went to the courthouse in Brookhaven to obtain absentee ballots he was distributing to African Americans so they could vote without intimidation. It was 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning and the square was filled with people. At least three white men set upon the unarmed Smith as he crossed the courthouse lawn and beat him mercilessly. Then at least two of them held him, while another fired a 38 revolver into his heart, and by one account fired a second shot into his mouth. Dozens of people stood nearby. The sheriff was close enough to recognize at least one of the killers and describe the blood stains on the shirt of another. The FBI investigation stated flatly that his assailants killed Smith in front of the sheriff. The grand jury apparently could not get enough evidence to indict, and therefore there was no indictment. And this is just the way it was. And this is where the Till case differs from everything else. Now let's spring forward a few weeks to uncover how this matter got to trial. As I said, I received a copy of a blog written by one M.J. O'Brien, who was writing a book on sit-ins in Jackson, and in the course of conversations with an acquaintance, Jerry Murph Moore, who had lived in Jackson, learned that Jerry, in her childhood, had lived in Webb, Mississippi, and that's where Mamie was from, and that her father had been on the grand jury that had indicted Nile and Brian. Further, that her father was coming for a visit and the rest of what I'm about to say is a direct quote from that blog. We moved down to Jackson from up in Tallahatchie County where my dad was a car salesman, she said in a slow southern drawl. In fact, do you know he served on the grand jury for the Emmett Till case? Your dad served on that grand jury? I asked, eyes glowing wide. Sure did, Jerry replied. Not the ones that let the guys off, she hastened to add. The jury that told the judge that they thought there was enough evidence to bring the case to trial. I was thunderstruck. Not that this sweet, discerning, harmless woman had anything to do with the most celebrated and horrifying case of the 50s, the murder that launched the modern civil rights movement. Is your dad alive? I asked haltingly. Sure is, Jerry replied. He's coming up in a few months if you want to talk to him. You think he'd be interested in putting his recollections on the record, I wonder, don't see why not. And then, um, fast forwarding, we go to the meeting that she had with Red, the father, and this is the young girl, this is her father, took place in Herndon, Virginia. Red was about to turn 84 in November and was up on a visit with his wife, Lance, at home with her his child. Red observed that Webb, Mississippi had a population of about 650 if you count the bird dog. <laughs> and in 1949, he opened a Chevrolet car and drug dealership. Uh, this is geographical point is also important since Webb lets, uh, sits less than three miles southeast of Sumner, the county seat where the trial was held. In 1955, the population of the entire Tallahatchie County was only about 30,000 souls, two-thirds of whom were recorded as non-white. Of the 10,000 or so whites, no more than 3,000 were adult males. Thus, jury selection was limited, and we had to consider whether or not the men had paid their $2 annual poll tax and were registered to vote. That gives us down to more, no more than 1,500. As a result, Red said, I usually got jury service about every two years. So it was not just by chance that he became part of the jury pool. And Red knew the two men who were accused of the crime. Both Mal and Bryant were customers of his at the Chevy dealership. Both had bought trucks from Red, 
In fact, it was in one of those trucks, Milan's 55 Chevy pickup, that Emmett Till was kidnapped and driven all over the floor, Tallahatchie, and even neighboring Sumner County, Sumner, Sunflower counties, before finally being taken to the edge of the river, stripped, shot, killed, tied up, and thrown in. And this was the part that really got me. He commended the work of the jury foreman, a Mr. Arnold Turner. The foreman of the grand jury was a good friend of mine, Red told me, and that was one reason I got on it. Turner was from a prominent Jewish family in Tallahassee County. Red believes that Turner may have had a hand in getting on the grand jury. I talked to someone and I said, well, I sure hope I get on the grand jury because I don't want to serve on the other one. And that's how it turned out. He also said Turner was a good and strong foreman for the task. Arnold handled it well, Red said, and he was fair. He was fair with everyone. And as I read this, cold chills went up and down my spine. Arnold Turner was one of my clients. He never mentioned this to me. Not only was he a client, he became a very, very good friend. And Arnold and Dorothy Turner's big social event was always uh, the Jewish holiday of Passover, which is a bit different from many uh, religious observances in that it's generally held in a home. And it tells the story of the exodus from Egypt. And for the Turners, they would have these huge, what we call Passover seders. The first night, they would invite all of their Jewish friends from within about a 40 mile radius, all 30 of them. <laughs> and, and the second night, just their family and the non-Jewish Christians. And they always invited me, and for many years, that's where I celebrated Passover. They were nice enough to include me both nights, but maybe because I brought all the wine down from <laughs> Memphis and you couldn't get wine in Mississippi. But, but they became very, very close friends. This was never mentioned. And until 2015, neither, none of his children or grandchildren ever knew about it. Just a quiet, unassuming person who got a lot done. The grand jury met on the, the afternoon of the day after Labor Day at the beginning of the three-week court session. The Tallahatchie County Attorney, one Hamilton Caldwell, uh, opposed seeking an indictment, but, quote, because he doubted that a jury would convict any white man found to have murdered a black who was accused of insults to a white woman. Then, nevertheless, the grand jury was convened, and perhaps due to the growing press coverage and the nation's shock about what they were hearing, there was a lot of pressure being brought, Red recalled. Mississippi wanted to show that it would play by the book with regard to the law. We met in the courthouse, Red said, in the jury room upstairs in the courthouse. This is one of the two courthouses in Tallahatchie County. We'll get to the other one in a minute. And that's where Red and his band of brothers led by Arnold Turner to consider the evidence game, gathered against Milan and Bryant and came down with an indictment. And this is just unheard of. The indictment came down on either September 5th or 7th. I was never able to get it straight. And the trial began September 19th. Not much time for transpired. The presiding judge was one Curtis Swango, who was from Sardis, Mississippi. And from everything I've read, it appears to have done a stellar job in a most hostile environment. On Monday, September 19th, jury selection began. It was to be an all-white male jury. Ten jurors were selected and on Tuesday the 20th, two more. And here are the 12, as they say, tried and true. It is to be noted that the selection was difficult because so many of the prospective jurors had contributed to the defense fund. Because of all the publicity, all eyes were on this courthouse in summer, with media from all over the country having descended on this tiny town, much reminiscent of the Scopes trial in Dayton, Tennessee in the 20s. The 
courtroom was full and over a thousand people were seated, out, seated outside. Order was maintained. This is Bryant, this is Milo. And order was maintained by the sheriff, one H.C. Strider, a 300 pound behemoth of a man, who in addition to being sheriff, was the owner of 1,500 acres of cotton land formed by 35 black sharecroppers, maintained a general store filling station on his property, and operated a crop that's blackjack in his pocket, and at the insistence of Judge Swango, was required to provide a table for the black press. There was black press and white press there, who he greeted each day with a salutation. Good morning, niggers. This gives us some idea of the atmosphere in which the trial proceeded. On Wednesday, the 21st, Moses Wright, here on the left, testified as first witness for the prosecution. The district attorney referred to him as Uncle Mose. This was a custom. You didn't refer to a black person as Mr. or Mrs. It was just not done. The Wright identified Mal and Brian as the persons who removed Till from Wright's house. The next witness, Chester Miller, the black undertaker, testified about picking up the body and at the request of the officers at the scene, he removed the ring from the body for purposes of identification. On Thursday the 22nd, Mamie Bradley, here in the center, took the stand and testified regarding her son's body and the ring she had given him just prior to leaving Chicago. The defense attorney on cross-examination painted her as being from Chicago and thus putting Chicago on trial for interfering with Mississippi. In essence, the defense was telling the jury that Southside Chicago was getting what it deserved. Willis Reed, here's Willis, an 18-year-old was the next witness. Reed had been unearthed by the black underground that had for days been scouring the countryside for witnesses. Reed testified that he had seen Till in the back of a pickup truck with four white men in the cab and three colored men in the back, one of whom he identified as being in a Till. Reed went to Leslie Milam's barn, that's a brother of J.W., for water and identified J.W. as coming outside the barn for water. He further testified he heard some hollering from the barn after J.W. returned and heard some licks like somebody was whipping somebody. The black underground unearthed two other witnesses, the two African Americans who were seen riding with Till in the back of Milam's pickup truck. But at the day of the trial, they could not be located. Apparently, somebody squealed to Sheriff Strider about this, and Sheriff Strider merely picked him up, took him to Charleston, Mississippi, and put him in jail. So they were unavailable for the trial. Tallahatchie County, and these names were right out of Faulkner, and neighboring Yalabusha County, had two county seats. There was in Tallahatchie County, one was in Sumner, one was in Charleston. So you had two courthouses for one small county of 30,000 people. It makes no sense. That's just the way it was. <laughs> the first witness for the defense was Carolyn Brown. When asked about the events of August 24th, the prosecutor objected, and the objection to the credit of the judge was sustained. Those events had nothing to do with the murder charge. The defense then asked the court to proffer her testimony and proffer it is to put into the record outside the presence of the jury uh, testimony that you contend is relevant and probative value. So on appeal, if the judge's ruling is inaccurate, the appellate court can send it back and say, hey, you need to hear that evidence. But anyhow, this is the direct quote from the court record as to how Carolyn testified. This nigger man came in the store and he stopped there at the candy counter. I asked him what he wanted. I got it and put it on top of the candy case. I held out my hand for his money. He caught my hand. 
<clears throat> he said, how about a date, baby? And I turned around and started to the back of the store. He came down that way, caught me at the cash register. Well, he put his left hand on my waist, and he put his other hand on the other side. He said, what's the matter, baby? Baby, can't you take it? Fifty years later, Carolyn told the author, William Bradford Huey, that the above was not true. And, quote, nothing that boy did could ever justify what happened to him. That was 50 years later. The next witness for the defense, a Dr. L.B. Ogden, was a practicing doctor in Greenwood and had viewed the body in the, quote, color funeral home, end quote. It was his testimony that the body was so mutilated that even a mother could not identify it. He also testified that one could not tell if the body was that of a white person or a colored person, notwithstanding the fact that the body was in the color funeral home. Now, even to this day, uh, I've lived in Chattanooga, Nashville, and Memphis. All the funeral homes are still segregated. There are white funeral homes and black funeral homes. And that's the way it is in 2018. The only difference is the black funeral homes charge a lot more than the white funeral homes. And sitting on the bench, you would have to prove certain expenditures. And the cost of a black funeral is just absolutely astronomical, but it's kind of a social type deal with very fancy printed programs and uh, a whole fancy set off. And when Congressman Ford's brother, uh, James Ford, died, uh, and unfortunately, a whole lot of other reasons I'm not going to go into, I drew his estate in my court. Uh, the cost of that funeral was $80,000. That's an expensive funeral. Sheriff Strider was the next witness, and he also testified that he saw the body, it was pulled from the river, and it was not capable of identification, notwithstanding the fact that he called Moses Wright. All the witnesses for the prosecution were black, and all of the witnesses for the defendants were white. After blatant segregation-themed closing statements from defense counsel, and I believe there were five of them, the jury retired at 2.34 p.m. After about an hour, the jury returned with a not guilty verdict. And this is Malin and Brian and their wives. After the verdict, this is the front page of the Memphis Commercial Appeal. Two Mississippians acquainted the slaying of Chicago Negro jurors out only 67 minutes. The jurors testified that they had made up their mind in about six minutes and they were just trying to make it look good. <laughs> That's a quote. Months later, January 24, 1956, in an interview published in Book Magazine, Milam and Bryant admitted they killed Till. But they couldn't be tried based on the time old double jeopardy standard. There was no Civil Rights Act. And this is an exact quote from the end. And this is now, quote, Well, what else could we do? He was hopeless. I'm no bully. I never heard a nigger in my life. I like niggers in their place. I know how to work them. But I just decided it was time a few people got put on notice. As long as I live and can do anything about it, niggers are going to stay in their place. Niggers ain't going to vote where I live. If they did, they'd control the government. They ain't going to go to school with my kids. And when a nigger gets close to mentioning sex with a white woman, he's tired of living. I'm likely to kill it. Me and my folks fought for this country, and we got some rights. I stood there in that shed and listened to that nigger throw that poison at me, and I just made up my mind. Chicago boy, I said, I'm tired of them sending your kind down here to stir up trouble. God damn you, I'm going to make an example of you just so everybody can know I 
how me and my folks stand. That's the way it was. And it's this saga, in my opinion, gave rise to the civil rights movement. And this is what remains at Bryant's grocery today. 14-year-old Emmett Till came to this site to buy candy in August 1955. White shopkeeper Carolyn Bryant accused the black youth of flirting with her. And shortly thereafter, Till was abducted by Bryant's husband and his half-brother. Till's tortured body was later found in the Tallahatchie River. The two men were tried and acquitted, but later sold their murder confession to Look Magazine. And that's what I was quoting from, was Look Magazine. Till's death received international attention widely credited as sparking the American Civil Rights Movement. And that's why I started the saga of Emmett Till. Any questions? Well, on, on, on what basis, Robert, were they acquitted? I mean, was, was the, 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 well, I mean, was it that these weren't, these weren't the men that killed this guy, or that the evidence was insufficient for? You know, you know the, the, the closing arguments were that they really couldn't identify the body. And he was somewhere up in Chicago. And the jury wasn't gonna the jury wasn't gonna convict a white person of killing a black. No, I understand that. You know, it's up to them, you know, did they do it or did he not do it? So no matter what the evidence was, they were gonna kind of come back with a not guilty verdict. So there's no real I mean there's and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, what, 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 did, what did the judge say? I mean, on what basis? The judge can't say anything. The judge is not the trier of fact. Well, he can direct, the trier can't of fact. He direct the jury? He can't. Not in a criminal case. He can't reverse the jury. Possibly to grant a new trial, but he didn't. Okay. Yes. Why was the uh, turnout for his funeral in Chicago so large? Because Mamie got a lot of publicity. She went to the radio stations the television stations, the black newspapers, and as you'll see, most of the people in the turnout are black. Chicago had a huge black population. And because of all this publicity, papers throughout the country picked up the story. I see. You have to also realize that in that time frame, the KKK was extraordinarily active and powerful. There was no question no, of that. Nobody challenged them. No. And a lot of them were the ones that carried out these murders. In Chattanooga, Tennessee, where I grew up, the biggest po political group was the Ku Klux Klan. Mm -hmm. It was so blatant that the Ku Klux Klan sponsored a team in the church softball. Oh. <laughs> uh, in the summers, the church softball league was a big deal. I played church softball for many, many, many years. But the Ku Klux Klan sponsored the team. Got a lot of publicity and they finally had to withdraw it. And the reason they withdrew it was some genius. I mean, a real genius. But the Ku Klux Klan and the Jewish Community Center team in the same bracket. <laughs> and that, 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 that's a genius. Can you tell us, Bob, what happened to the black young black man who testified to kept the trial. Uh, all I know is he left Tallahatchie County and never returned. <laughs> How did it happen that charges were even brought against the husband and the half-brother? Was there a complaint filed against them? Well, the grand jury, you know, the evidence, always a prosecuting attorney will present evidence to a grand jury of a murder. And this was an obvious murder. You know, he didn't want them to indict, but they decided they were going to indict, and they did. They thought it was the right thing to do. It was very unusual. First case I know of. Thank you all. <laughs>